Welcome to church, everybody. We are so glad that each and every one of you are here today, whether you are in the room or whether you are joining us online. Thank you so much for showing up. And uh, this is what I believe. You didn't just show up physically, but you're ready to learn, right? We're going to lean in. We're going to be ready to hear what God has to say to us today. I've been praying for you guys today and just believing that the message today really is going to be impactful. And I believe this today, that it's for every single one of us. Every single one of us. And, you know, we're in this series called Red Skies, Signs of the Times, right? And in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, we read that once again, all throughout Scripture this happens in the New Testament, that Jesus is once again being tested by the religious leaders of the day. And this is just, it's just real short, three verses found in Matthew chapter 16, and it explains this whole red skies thing and this little interaction that Jesus is having with these religious leaders. And this is what it says. It says, the Pharisees and Sadducees approached and tested Jesus, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, I will, it will be good weather because the sky is red. And the morning... Today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. Really what he's saying is you can look out your window, okay, and you can see whether it's going to be a good day or a bad day with the weather, but there are all kinds of things happening around your world, religious leaders, that you're not kind of like, you're not cued into. And guess what Jesus tells us today? There, we have the ability, listen, to be able to, to kind of look at culture and go, hey, what's happening here? He actually wants us to be doing that. And over these last few weeks, we've been talking about different signs that that are happening in our culture and in the church and what our response is as followers of Jesus. Because that's why we're here today, because of Jesus, right? And we're going, how, what are we supposed to do with these things that we see? What are we supposed to do with these things that are happening around us? There are always signs of the time happening. And as people of faith, listen, we have the Holy Spirit We have the Holy Spirit who can help us see what is happening in culture, in the church, and then know what to do. What are we supposed to do? And today, I'm going to talk about a topic, something that I'm seeing in culture, that I think we've all seen in culture, that, like I said, I think uh, affects each and every one of us. And I don't know about you, if you've noticed it or not, but everywhere I look, people tend to be perpetually offended. If you say the wrong thing, I'm offended. If you wear the wrong thing, offended. If you look at someone the wrong way, offended. You give your opinion on social media, everybody's got an opinion and they're offended about that opinion. Right? We are offended over the small things. We're offended over the big things and everything in between. (laughs) Becoming offended is unavoidable, you guys. But living offended is a choice. Becoming offended is unavoidable. It's going to happen. But living offended, day in and day out, perpetually being offended, man, it's a choice. And people in our world are living offended. It's almost like we're looking for opportunities to take up an offense. It's like our radar is up, like we can't wait. We love that feeling. I don't know why. It's it's actually a terrible feeling to live offended. And this is a sign of our time. And unfortunately, the mindset has affected Christians who have been called by God to live differently. We've been called by God to live what I'm going to label today is called a neo-life. N-E-O, life. Yes, we have a new life, but we're also called to have a neo-life, to live a neo-life, which means this, not easily offended. Not easily offended. We as Christ followers, we are called to live different, to respond different. And here's the deal. I know that's not easy. It's not easy in this culture, but it is possible. It's possible. 
And as I talk about this idea of living the neo life today, I want you to know this. I want you to know this that I completely understand that there are small offenses in life, and then there's big ones. There's big things. Some of you are carrying big offenses today because people hurt you deeply. And as we dive into this topic today, I don't make light of those. I want you to hear that. I don't make light of those. But at the same time, Scripture is full of of instruction and also stories on how to overcome living offended, how not to live offended. And today we're going to learn from a man named David in Scripture how to live this type of neo-life and what to do when we... want to be offended because here's the deal it's not if it's going to happen it's when it's going to happen it's just going to happen we're going to run into situations because here's the deal we're all human nudge your neighbor and say you're human you're human and where there are humans there will be offense (laughs) there will be an offense and when you read about david in scriptures you see if you if you've read any bit of the old testament you see that david had a lot of opportunities to live offended (laughs) He had a lot of things happen to him. And today, we're going to look at one story that's found in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 2 through 42. If you want to just write that down somewhere in your notes, or if you're on the app, it's, it's, it's probably listed there. But 1 Samuel 25, verses 2 through 42. And I'm not going to read it all today, but I encourage you that to some point, some point this week, just read through the whole, the whole story. It's pretty fascinating. But before we kind of dive into the story, I want to give a little background. So here's David. Okay, David has actually been anointed to be the next king of Israel. Okay, this is thousands of years ago. Okay, thousands of years ago. David has been anointed to be the next king of Israel, but he had been running from the current crazy king by the name of Saul for a long time. This crazy king Saul was trying to kill David. Okay, so David's anointed to be king. Saul is the king, and he's crazy, and he's jealous of David, and he's chasing after him. Okay, so David finds himself in the wilderness with 600 of his men. And he's just one of these days, they happen upon a group of shepherds who work for a very wealthy man named Nabal. So we have David, and then we have this very wealthy man named Nabal, who his shepherds are out in the field, and, and David comes up, and he, and he happens upon these people. Well, out in the fields, while he's out there in the fields with the shepherds and Nabal's livestock, David and his men, listen, were really good to these shepherds. They end up even defending them against an attack from the Philistine army. So David helps out. Now, the Bible says this, okay, about Nabal, that he had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep. You want to know what that means? He was loaded. He was loaded. That's what that means. You're like going, really? 1,000 goats, 3,000 sheep? Yes, back then he was loaded. In other words, here's the deal. Part of Nabal's wealth was found in the enormous amount of goats and sheep that he had. Very wealthy. And without David and his men protecting and defending the shepherds and livestock, Nabal could have lost much of his wealth. So if David hadn't, like, come to the rescue of Nabal's shepherds, he could have lost a bunch of his wealth. So since David had defended Nabal's wealth, he knew what kind of resource Nabal had, okay? And being that David is running for his life, and he's out in the wilderness with 600 mouths to feed, hello, (laughs) and he's been on the run, he decides to humbly ask Nabal for some food. So David sends 10 men to Nabal, because he's like, well, I might as well ask, because I know this guy is loaded, okay? So might as well just, might as well ask. So David sends these men, and this is what he says for his men to tell Nabal. He says, say to him, long life to you, good health to you in your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now, I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my men, since we come at a festive time, please Give your servants and your son David whatever you can find them. Whatever you can find them. So David, listen, did you hear the tone of that? David speaks blessings upon Nabal, right? And he humbly asks for whatever you can find. 
whatever you can find. And I want to remind us of something here, okay? David was anointed to be king. And everybody knew this for the most part. Okay, Nabal probably knew this, meaning this, that David didn't have to ask Nabal. He could have demanded it. He could have just said, listen, give, you need to pay us back. You, you need to pay me back for defending and protecting your wealth. Instead, David is full of humility, and he asks kindly. And what is Nabal's response? I'm glad you asked. Verses 10 and 11. It says, Nabal answered David's servants. Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? So Nabal's response is basically that of a typical jerk. Okay? He's being a jerk, right? His response is insulting. And it's a big fat no to David. I don't care what you did for my men. You, you need some food and water? Nope, I'm not going to do it. How many of you know that sometimes your kindness will not be noticed, appreciated, or valued? And this is what happened to David. As you might have guessed, this did not go over well with David. That's why we're talking about offense today. Okay, it didn't go over well with David. So what does David do? Verse 13, David said to his men, each of you, strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. So David is not happy, right? He is not happy. He is what? Offended. (laughs) And he tells his buddies, listen, strap on your swords. And then he gets his too. He's like, I'm ready. He's ready to go take care of some business, right? He's all, everybody's like, yes, David, let's go. Strap on the sword, you strap on yours, right? Here's the deal. And this, right, this is what we all want to do when somebody has offended us. Somebody hurts you, offends you, betrays you, you don't like something they said about you, you know they don't agree with you. We call 400 of our best friends, right, on Facebook, and we get ready to go hurt somebody. And everybody's like, that's right. I'm going to take up that offense with you. We've all done these type of things. Actually, I will never forget. This is a very abbreviated story. It's, it's actually quite comical. It was not at the moment. This was years ago. My mom called me one day, and my mom is the most gracious woman in all the land, okay? She is the kindest person, and she just happened to share with me that somebody had done something very hurtful to her, and I was on the phone with her, and I literally said, Mom, thank you so much for sharing with me that, and I'll talk to you later. I hang up. I go and start putting my shoes on, my coat on. I know where this person lives. And you're like... Really, Jen? Oh, yes, really. I love Jesus at this point, but I was ready. My mom calls my husband, Jer, you know, and is like, you need to stop your wife. Where is she going? Where is she at? And so Jer hangs the phone. Where are you going? I was like, I'm just leaving. I'll be back. I'll I'll be right back. Don't worry about it. And he's all like, your mom said I'm not supposed to let you leave the house. (laughs) I'm like, well, she's right. Okay, here's the deal. When somebody has hurt and offended us or hurt and offended others, it's really easy to strap on the sword and go, let's go. Because it hurts and it's not nice and it's not good. But the question is this. I didn't leave, by the way. My husband did not let me leave the house that day. And I'm really glad that he did not let me leave the house. (laughs) The question is this in those situations. Is there a better way? Is there a wiser way? And after Nabal had sent the offensive message back to David, there's a little situation that happens. A wise servant that had seen the whole thing happen. Okay, it's one of Nabal's servants, and he's a wise servant, the scripture calls him. He sees what's happening, and so he actually goes and tells Nabal's wife, Abigail. Okay, Abigail, she's a huge part of this story. He goes and tells Nabal's wife, Abigail, what had happened and how disaster is now hanging over their house. 
And he tells her this, and he says to her, I want you to listen to this line, now think it over and see what you can do. Now think it over, Abigail. Things are not good here. I can tell that this is, this is escalated far beyond <laughs> probably what it should have. Okay, so think about it, Abigail, and see what you should do. So let's see what happens. What is Abigail's response? It says this, Abigail acted quickly. She's a smart girl. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sayas of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs. They had quite the pantry, my people. She takes all of this and loaded them on donkeys, and then she told her servants, go ahead, go ahead of me, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal, again, wise woman. So the food goes first, and then Abigail comes behind, and she intersects, intersects with um, with David, right in the middle, okay? So David has obviously seen the food, and then he keeps going, and he intersects with B Abigail, and it says this, please pay, listen, this is what she says, please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent, and now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming you, my Lord, be like Nabal. And let this gift, this gift of food, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. And she keeps on. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. I know there's a lot there. We're going to break it down. Because Abigail was a very wise woman. She thought about what she could do, and then she acted quickly. When you have your sword strapped on and you're ready to go to battle, what should you do? When you're ready, how do we, another way of asking that is when, when you are offended, what do you do? What should we do? Or how do we live a life that is a neo life, a not easily offended life? Well, the first thing that we learn from the story is this. Listen to the woman who brings you lots of food. Just kidding. That's not really number one. It's still good advice. The first one, the real number one is this. Pay attention to the roadblock. Pay attention to the roadblock. David is on his way to meet Nabal. And who happens to meet him? Abigail. Abigail. Have you ever, okay, this is talking to us here, have you ever been about ready to pick up that phone and give somebody a piece of your mind? Or have you ever been about ready to drive over to that place like I was? <laughs> have you ever been about ready to send that text, about ready to type out that DM and hit send, or to post that comment, about ready to give someone a piece of your mind? When there is a still, small voice. Or maybe you're on your way and you hit a red light and you're kind of forced to pause and think. <laughs> or maybe you run into someone on your way out the door. <laughs> or you have a thought. This isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. I shouldn't do it. Oftentimes, when we are about ready to take revenge or to get someone back, God will place a roadblock in our way to get us to pause and think. Don't blow by those. Don't blow by those. Abigail was David's roadblock. And this is what I want you to know. He could have just killed her and kept going. Do you see that? But instead... 
he paused and he stopped to listen to a voice of reason. He paused. He could have blown right by her. He could have been like, "Uh uh-uh, I am so fueled and I got 400 of my friends behind me that are with me. But instead, he paused. God will often put roadblocks in our way before we are about ready to say something or do something really stupid. (laughs) Don't blow past those. Don't blow past those. That's one of the first things that we need to do to live a not easily offended life is don't blow past the roadblocks. Don't blow past them. The second thing is this. Pause to listen to wise counsel. Pause to listen to wise counsel. It's easy, listen, it's easy to call 400 of your friends who will strap a sword to their side for you, but it's a little bit more difficult to listen to one calm and reasonable voice of wisdom. It's so easy to call the 400 people. It's so easy to call the people that will just agree with you. But God's like, hey, 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 listen, there's a voice of reason. Listen to it. Abigail showed up, but often, here's the deal, we will need to seek out wise counsel. Don't just ask someone who's going to side with you. But that's easy. It's quiet in here. Because I do it, you do it. It's easy, because here's the deal, there's people who love us, and what they're going to do is, it would have been really easy for Jared to be like, well, I'm getting the car with you, I'm going to take this lady out. Instead, the voice of reason was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just think about this. Pastor's wife hurts lady. (laughs) Be real great, huh? Good headlines. But it would have been much easier probably for Jer to be like, that's right. We're going to take this. We're just going to do something about this. But instead... To pause and listen to a voice of reason. It stopped me from doing something I know to this day I would regret. I would be giving you a very different story of this. Sometimes, listen, wisdom will find its way to you. Other times, you will need to seek it out. Are you holding on to something? Are you about about ready to send that text? when When there's something that is really important to me, I usually have somebody else read it or someone else speak into it because I'm like, I need another voice of reason because right now I'm hot-headed. I'm hot-headed and I'm hurt and I'm offended. And so it's good to seek out wise counsel. Often when we have taken up an offense, we don't want to listen to people. We want to go do our thing. And can I just challenge us with something today, okay? I want to implore us not to just seek the voice of wisdom, but to also be the voice of wisdom wisdom and reason to others when they come to you. Don't just immediately strap the sword on for others, for your friends. May we be like Abigail and pause, even when someone brings something to us and go, okay, now let me think it over and see what I can do. What, how can I be helpful to this situation? Because there are often times it is not going to be helpful to David to have 400 people going, yes, David, go kill him. <laughs> Here's the deal. Was there any one of those 400 men that was all like, mm, this is probably not a good idea? And can we just be real honest with you? I want you to think about this story. David asked for food. Nabal said no. And now David strapped on his sword and about ready to go kill a man. Seems like a bit of an overreaction to me. Right? I mean, so you're, you're, he offended you, David. You're a little, he's exhausted probably, David, right? I've been living in the wilderness trying to feed 600 men and there's all type of situations and then this one thing happens. This man doesn't do what I asked him to do kindly. It was a little passive aggressive if you think about it on David's side. He's all like, I'm humbly asking and then all of a sudden he says no and he's all like, I'm coming after you. So there was almost a slight bit of overreaction, right? But man, May we be people who can reasonably look and say, what are the roadblocks that are happening for me right now? 
Maybe listen to the voice of reason and not just the 400 that are in my corner. And maybe, maybe we can just be a part for each other of the solution, right? Because Abigail was somebody, Abigail saw the big picture. Do you see that? She saw the big picture. She was like, for the sake of David, the future king, and for the sake of my home, for the sake of my family, for the sake of the servants, I have to do something. And I'm going to be a voice of wisdom and reason in the middle of it. The third thing that we can do to live a neo-life is this. Stop paying attention to the fool. Stop paying attention to the fool. Quit giving them your attention. Quit giving it to them. It's torturing you. Abigail. What did she say? She said, please pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. His name means fool. He's a fool. And my question for us today is who or what are you focusing on? Who or what are you focusing on? Some of us haven't acted on anything yet. But we play things over and over and over in our mind. That person that hurt you. And like I said earlier, please Hear this, I am not making light of one single situation that is being carried in this room today. God knows, he sees, he is for you, he is with you, but he also knows, listen, that carrying an offense is not going to have any benefit for you. I mean, you guys, this isn't just, this is a spiritual issue, but it's also, I mean, if you go to Mayo Clinic or even some other doctor's offices, there are literally pamphlets that talk about how unforgiveness hurts you physically. Like, literally, like, the power of forgiveness at Mayo Clinic, out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's like, I wasn't talking to a doctor going, I am struggling with unforgiveness, and then they pulled out the pamphlet. It's everywhere. Because this is why we live in an offended world. And when we live this way, it not only has spiritual implications, but it has physical implications for us. And God knows that. You know, I've had, I remember there was, this was not the same story, but years later there was a deep hurt that Jerry and I experienced. And I remember every time I would get in my car and I would be driving by myself, I literally was playing things over and over and over in my head. For months. I was, I mean, it was my focus, my attention was on that situation. And it was on that person. And it was how, like, I had kept my mouth shut. I hadn't done anything yet, but man, I know it would have felt so good to share my side of the story. Right? And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it, and it was robbing me. It was robbing me. We keep focusing on the fool that offended us, that hurt us. Don't allow the actions of a fool make you act like a fool. Don't allow it. They've taken enough from you. Don't keep giving it. Don't keep giving it. The fourth thing that we can do to live a neo-life, a not easily offended life, is this. Look beyond the now. Look beyond the now. I love that. In Abigail's like entreaty to David, right? She, repli- she repeatedly was shifting his focus. If you could see that. She was, she, was, she was shifting his focus from what was going on. She was like, don't look at the fool. And then he, she was also going things like, when you've been brought success. Because, right, he's anointed to be king and she knows this. She's like, listen, like, when you've been anointed to be king, when God's goodness has, has you know, been brought to fruition in your life, when you are in the position where God has blessed you, listen, when the Lord has fulfilled every good thing he promised, she's going, listen, don't, don't look at this right now. Look forward. Look to the future. Because this is the deal. What is done in the short term sticks with you in the long term. David had every right. He was going to be king. And you don't talk to kings the way Nabal talked to David. So really, he had every right, even though I think it was an overreaction, he had every right to go and do whatever he wanted to do, right? That's what the king does. But here's the deal. Abigail knew that David would live in great regret if he followed through on what he was going to do. 
She knew it. She knew it. Some of us need to look beyond the now. What you want to do right now, how you want to pay, make them pay right now, how you want to, you know, voice your opinion right now in the big, in the small, whatever it might be. Ask yourself, what are the ramifications of what I'm about ready to do? What happens if you decide to act on your feelings of hurt and hate? What happens? Yeah, these are good questions to ask yourself. How does, if I act on all of this, how does that play out one, five, or ten years from now for me, my family, my relationships, my purpose, what God has for me? How is that going to play out? How's it going to affect other people that are in my life? So what was David's response to Abigail's voice of reason? I love this. What was David's response? Remember, David's still in the field. It's him and Abigail, and she's been telling him all this. What is his response? It says this. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to me, to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Thank you. What is his response? It is not like, gosh darn it, I want to keep going. It's, oh dear God, thank you for being a voice of reason. God, thank you. Praise be to God for keeping me from avenging myself because it would have had an effect on me. So here's the question. A question. I've asked you lots of questions today. What is the benefit of letting God avenge your offenses and hurts? I think it's like you might even, you may have already even asked yourself that question sitting in here or listening in today. What's the benefit, Jen? Because you have no idea how much I want to avenge my own hurt. What's the benefit? I've actually thought long and hard about this, especially in regards to the story. I mean, really, what is the benefit, right, of letting God avenge your offenses and hurts versus you taking matters into your own hands and paying people back for what they've done to you? David had every right to be mad, and here's the deal. I get it. You probably do too. And I think one of the benefits is found in verse 31 when Abigail is speaking. She says this, My Lord, David, will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed of having avenged himself. The benefit is a clear conscience. From what? The staggering burden of needless bloodshed. Here's the deal. Oftentimes when we take things into our own hands, we may not cause physical bloodshed, but we will damage not just the person we want to pay back, but probably others as well. And you are literally attaching yourself to that offense deeper and deeper. David would have never been rid of Nabal if he would have followed through on what he wanted to do. Nabal always would have been there in the memory of what he did. With our words, our actions, our anger, we want to avenge. Abigail knows that he'll regret his decision to pay back himself. And I can attest to this. At the end of the day, I have been so glad, so glad that I didn't go to the house. So glad that eventually I was like, and listen, here's the deal. Dropping an offense, for some of us, it's so deep and it was so hurtful. It's going to be over and over and over again. God, I forgive. God, I drop it. I don't want to hang on to it anymore. I choose not to take revenge myself. In a world that lives offended, even when they might not have a right to, Jesus offers a better way. A better way. Not easier, but better. And I want to remind us of that today, you guys. Jesus knows it's not easy, but he has your best interest in mind. You know, there is the, I was thinking about this last night as we close up, and then I'm going to close this in prayer. I was sitting outside. I know it's cold outside, but I felt like sitting outside. I've actually learned to love the cold, and I was sitting there, and I was actually praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The disciples had asked Jesus, how do you pray? How do you pray? And then Jesus gives this this short prayer, if you think about it. And in there it talks about how amazing God is. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us our daily bread. And then what is a part of that? Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. One of the reasons why we forgive others is because we have been forgiven. Everything you have ever done wrong, every sin, every mistake, every grudge, every time you have taken revenge, every mess up forgiven. And Jesus says, listen, pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you today, and I thank you for my friends. God, I thank you for your goodness. I know this is a heavy subject, and I actually talk about it quite a lot because I believe, God, that it it is so important, and the enemy would love for us to hold tight to things, for have us to be like this culture. We live easily offended on the big and the small, but I pray today, God, that you would give us a hunger for your way, that truly today, God, that we would see the benefit of it and that, God, we would lean into your way and not our way. God, give courage where there needs to be courage. Give strength where there needs to be strength. Give us the ability, Lord God, and the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive those who need to be forgiven, to let go and to live not easily offended. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I know this is not really a message about salvation, but every time that we gather together as a church, we want to give people an opportunity if they want to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of their life to make that decision. Because here's the deal, you just heard it. Jesus forgives everything, everything you've ever done, everything you've wanted to do, everything you've carried, every burden, every shame, Jesus wants to lift that. If you want to make that decision today, we're going to say a brief prayer, but a powerful prayer of you just saying, I want to make that decision today, Jen. So let's pray together. Dear Jesus, Today I choose to make Jesus the leader and forgiver of my life. I turn from my old ways and I embrace God today. Thank you for your forgiveness and your purpose. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.